Hi y'all, in this video I'm going to be talking about the shooting that happened in Florida recently and the law enforcement response to it. Uh, this is not a video on gun rights or gun control, but in the interest of full disclosure for the gun control advocates, you and I are not going to see eye to eye on that issue, but this video is not about that. I will do another video about that later and you can come uh, tell me why I'm wrong. This is about uh, the responsibilities of law enforcement, what it should be like, what it shouldn't be like, what it should do, what it shouldn't do, those types of things. And it should appeal to pretty much everyone across the political spectrum, except for the most kinds of extreme positions, like if you're an ANCAP, it's not going to appeal to you. If you are uh, the furthest to the left leftist, uh, you're probably not going to like it either. But for everyone else in between, it's going to be up your alley. So whether you are a very strict law and justice kind of uh, conservative, there'll be a lot in here about rules, so uh, and the enforcement of them and the uh, obligations of public officials in respect of enforcing those rules, you'll like that. Uh, it's also about the relationships between law enforcement and the community and their professionalism and how law enforcement does not treat the citizenry particularly well. Uh, so that will appeal to the left. And I'm not doing this to pander. It's just a, a good survey of the field and, and the state of law enforcement as it exists. So we'll be discussing um, some different principles of law enforcement, like the Pelian principles. Uh, if you want the shortcut version, if you watch the movie Roadhouse, it's essentially that discussion between the difference between the cooler and the bouncer. It's your job to be nice until it's time not to be nice. And uh, we don't really have that in the United States and a lot of police agencies. Uh, there's a lot of incompetence. Now, one of the issues, well, before I get into some of the issues, uh, there's something called the Herman Brain Dominance Instrument. There are many different kinds of uh, ways of breaking down how people view the world. But the one with which I'm most familiar is the HPDI. And uh, so people are familiar with left brain thinkers and right brain thinkers. But you can further subdivide it into quadrants, where it's A, B, C, D, and A is your analytically minded folks, which I am. It's my strongest quadrant. Uh, those tend to be physicists, mathematicians, chemists, things of that nature. Uh, so that's the analytic part. Then you have the, the B types, which are more of your sequential thinkers. They like step-by-step -step rules. Um, they like making lists and organizing them, so they tend to be like accountants. Then you have um, your interpersonal relationship thinkers, which are the C types. Um, they tend to be your social workers, psychologists. Uh, they're very much into how people feel and their relationships between people. And then you have your D-type, which tend to be your more creative thinkers. Those are more like your artists, your artists, musicians, uh, actors, things of that nature. Although, um, no one is, is all one and none of the other. For my spread is A is my strongest, B and D are about equal, and C is my weakest. So interpersonal relationships are not my strong suit. They're my weakest suit, but I'm still, you know, I can still do them. I'm adequate with that. And you can tell the difference between whether or not the person's a creative type thinker or a... Um, a data type thinker by whether they talk about whether or not they feel like the solution to something is X, Y, or Z, or whether or not they think that the solution to a particular thing is X, Y, or Z, or they'll say things like the data show that X, Y, Z are the consequences or whatever it happens to be. So those are the, the broad divides. And there's a little bit of something here for uh, all of those types of people who have one of those primary uh, quadrants of thinking for all of the problems of the model. So uh, before I get into that, real quick, I would just like to um, re remind people or advise them for the first time if they haven't been here what my general view on law enforcement is and the profession of arms. I think it's a, it is a noble profession uh, for which only a small subset of society will be uh, fit to serve in. And one of the reasons that I have not made a video on this to date is because cowardice is one of the few things that really gets me worked up. Um, you go If you go into law enforcement, I used to be in it, for any aspiring cops. Don't get mad at the murderers or the rapists. That is a pathway to emotional destruction for you. You have to view it uh, more me mechanistically than that. Uh, there's a game that is being played. You have your role to play. The murderer, the rapist, the kidnapper, the arson, they have their role to play. Just You're, you're in a, a big uh, drama and you have to play your part. And if you start letting yourself get angry or emotionally compromised by the evil actions of others, uh, there is a future of alcoholism for you, of depression for you, of psychological assistance for you, uh, because you're you're too emotionally invested in it. it. You have, when you go into law enforcement, you should do it for the purpose of you know that there's a light within you that you want to shine onto the world, but you need to realize you're going to be surrounded by darkness uh, a lot of the time, and that darkness will touch you and it will diminish your light. Uh, the extent to which it diminishes that light that you have within you. 
depends upon your uh, mental and emotional reserves to resist it. Part of that is having a good mindset about how to go about dealing with these people. But cowards are different. That is, um, you expect your brothers in arms to behave in a particular way uh, because they have taken a solemn vow to do that kind of work. And when they betray you with their cowardice, uh, that is one of those, those things that uh, you, you can't really prepare for uh, too particularly well. And it's just going to catch you by surprise. It's going to make you angry. It gets me really worked up. And as George Washington said in one of his first general orders, it is a noble cause we are engaged in. It is the cause of virtue in mankind. Every temporal advantage and comfort to us and our posterity depends upon the vigor of our exertions. In short, freedom and slavery must be the result of our conduct. Uh, there can therefore be no greater inducement to men to behave well. But it may not be amiss for the troops to know that if any man in action shall presume to skulk, hide himself, or retreat from the enemy without the orders of his commanding officer, he will be instantly shot down as an example of cowardice. Cowards have too frequently uh, disconcerted the best formed troops by their dastardly behavior. Um, in other words, cowards, traitors, those types of people, they are the lowest of the low. They're worse than murderers, they're worse than rapists, because there's just an element of, of, of you know, the criminal that is always going to be with us. And in order to resist that, you depend upon non-cowards to take a solemn vow to stand up against them. And when the people have taken a solemn vow to do a certain thing, refuse to do the thing they have promised on their life and on their honor to do, uh, it can wreak uh, much, much worse problems throughout society than the bare fact that there are murderers and rapists and arsonists and burglars who uh, walk among us. So I want to talk about the Pelian principles, which were developed in the uh, early 19th century. And uh, this was the, the first professional police force, as we would recognize it, are called the Bow Street Runners, which came about in the middle of the 18th century. And after about 70 years of their conduct, which was a bit corrupt, uh, a guy named Robert Peel was, this is from England, Sir Robert Peel, so I guess I'll be, I'll be really formal with him now that he's dead. Uh, but Sir Robert Peel in the Home Office in the U UK decided to ask the question, what would a professional police force look like? It's, it's the, the first principles kind of thing. If you weren't involved in the system, you knew nothing about it, and you were just going to devise intelligently, a police force, a professional police force, What, by what principles would it operate? What would you expect the people you're paying to behave like? And uh, so they came up with, with several principles, which unfortunately um, are either not taught to law enforcement anymore or are not uh, sufficiently well taught to law enforcement for it to be indoctrinated. If you go look at some of the videos of the way law enforcement responded, you know, the ones who actually went in, they went in telling the students, turn off your fucking cell phones, put down your fucking cell phones. There's no need to talk to people like that. And this isn't about PC culture. This is about a profession. This is a vocation. You are there to be a professional. There's no reason whatever that you should be shouting obscenities at people if, unless you are in a, a contest for life and death, like drop the fucking gun. Of course, I can't help but mention, and you know, I can't help but observe and therefore to mention, that when you add in extra words to a command, you're delaying the amount of time it takes you to issue the command. Uh, not particularly efficient. But anyway, so the Pelian principles. Um, <clears throat> to prevent crime and disorder as an alternative to their repression by military force and severity of legal punishment. This is the deterrence aspect. To be seen uh, on, the on, the, on the assumption that it will deter some subset of criminals if they see uh, police officers in the area, knowing that the job of the police is to enforce the law, to detect them, to deter them, to uh, investigate them, to prosecute them, that that will deter some subset of people from uh, committing their crimes in that location. They will go elsewhere. This is a recurring theme in any of these types of incidents. Incidentally, on these types of incidents, or any type, kind of incident, people like to reduce it to like one dimension of variables. It is, oh, uh, the person at fault for this is the murderer. The person at fault for this is the police officer who didn't go in. The person who is responsible for this is the NRA, or it is the, the uh, existence of guns. Uh, all of these play a part, but none of them is the answer. These are what, in logic and causality, you would call INUS conditions, uh, they, each of which is insufficient, non-redundant, unnecessary, but when put together are nevertheless sufficient to produce the outcome that you see. Uh, so the people who want to reduce it to, to one axis and say it's this, it's this kind of thing, 
uh, really are not going to be very useful in this conversation because they want to reduce it to some kind of artificial sol artificial problem to which they'll devise an artificial solution that won't address the problem. Um, so the murderer, the rapist, the burglar, the arsonist, the bank robber, they are the background, one of the background conditions and they are going to strike somewhere sometime and once they choose a target to go attack the target is left in the unfortunate position of only having a, the defense that it is prepared to have beforehand given the, the existence, given the background fact that murderers, rapists, all these other people uh, out there exist. And so if you choose not to do something, you are much more at the mercy of the, uh, the person who seeks to make you his or her victim, and that is unfortunate. One of the solutions to that is a professional police force to protect and to serve. We'll address that later on in the Pelian Principles. Um, so to recognize always, always that the power of the police to fulfill their functions and duties is dependent upon public approval of their existence, actions, and behavior, and on their ability to secure and maintain public respect. Having a bunch of cowards in your midst is not a way to do that. Screaming at uh, high school students to put, turn off their fucking cell phones for the reason they don't want the cell phones on is one, it records their uh, their unprofessional behavior, but the excuse they'll give you is that they want to protect their their method for organizing people and getting people out, doesn't want to give anybody a tactical advantage because, you know, there's an infinite number of ways they could actually get people to line up and walk out of a building. Anyway, um, so there's that. They just don't want their unprofessional conduct to be recorded and broadcasted on uh, the internet or in the news. So to recognize, oh, I'm sorry, I already read that. To recognize always, uh, nope, I didn't read that. I'm terribly sorry. To recognize always that to secure and maintain the respect and approval of the public means to secure the willing cooperation of the public in the task of securing observance of laws. The fuck you, uh, get the fuck on the ground, uh, turn off your fucking cell phones, and this kind of very uh, needlessly aggressive language for people who aren't resisting is not a way to go about engendering public confidence in the task of securing the observance of the laws. You have to remember public servants uh, should behave in a particular way. If I personally hired a servant who spoke to me that way, I would not long keep that servant in my employ. Law enforcement needs to get away from this. I like the concept of the militarization of the police, but not in the, the way that that term is ordinarily used. They mean it to talk about the equipment. I, when I think of the military, having served in it, the thing I think of first and foremost is its discipline. Um, you will not get, get far in the military if you speak to your peers uh, or your superiors in that kind of way. Uh, the citizens here are sovereign, not the police. Uh, you are here to serve the citizens. And unless there is a, a really pressing purpose to behave that aggressively, then you should not do it. It works, uh, it, it's orthogonal to your actual objectives, which is securing public cooperation. To recognize always that the extent to which the cooperation of the public can be secured diminishes proportionally to the necessity of the use of physical force and compulsion for achieving police objectives. It's a nice way of saying be nice until it's time not to be nice. And just like in the movie Roadhouse, how do I know when it's time not to be nice? I'll tell you when. There will be a set of rules for when it's time to no longer be nice. If you don't need to be pulling out your gun uh, and a person isn't physically assaulting you, it's probably one of those times where you should uh, try being nice and saying, uh, get the fuck on the ground, motherfucker, I'll shoot you, motherfucker, don't disobey me, motherfucker, Drop, turn off your fucking phone. Not terribly uh, civil, not remotely professional. To seek and preserve public favor, not by pandering to public opinion, but by constantly demonstrating absolutely impartial service to law in complete independence of policy and without regard to the justice or injustice of the substance of the individual laws, um, you have to make some adjustments here when you take the, the British conception of it and translate that onto the American system because we have a written constitution that prohibits the government from doing certain things. This doesn't exist in the UK where they have parliamentary supremacy. Uh, what, what is the law? It's whatever the parliament says the law is of the day. If the parliament passes a law that you have to enucleate every second child and rape every third child, well, you know, by this principle you would just have to obey that without any consideration whatever about how evil it is in the United States. Uh, we have, uh, at least on paper, a backdrop against that. So 
there would be certain, you know, which is itself a law, but there would be certain uh, background principles that wouldn't allow those types of laws to be enforced. Police officers would be expected not to simply be following orders, but to understand the law, to be trained in the law, and to know that such a law would not be valid, and therefore they should ignore it. But here's the important part. By ready offering of individual service and friendship to all members of the public without regard to their wealth or social standing, by ready exercise of courtesy and friendly good humor, and by ready offering of individual sacrifice in protecting and preserving life. You saw absolutely zero of that in the police response in Florida. Not a lick of it was present. They were aggressively rude, abusive to students who had done nothing wrong. They knew that the students weren't waving firearms at them. The way you know that is they told them, put down your phones, turn off your phones. They didn't say drop the gun. Not a single officer was confused about what these students were carrying. They all knew that they were just cell phones, that they weren't weapons, they weren't a threat to the police. Nevertheless, uh, in this quest to establish dominance, uh, they have to behave in a way that is unnecessary. It is The students were willing to follow the police uh, in, in this case. There was no reason at all to talk to them that way, and when there's no reason at all to behave in such an aggressive way, there is every reason in the world to not behave in that way. This is why the peeling principles need to be uh, reinvigorated in police training and to be enforced. The, the, way, the reason that officers out in the field get away with this kind of behavior is because of the incompetence, the ineptitude of the leadership and the indifference of the leadership. Any of these police uh, chiefs, any of these sheriffs out there disciplining their officers for talking to people this way? No, not a lick of it. Perfectly acceptable conduct. Not in my mind. Uh, I never spoke that way to someone on, uh, when I was arresting them. If I, got, uh, with, if I was using aggressive language, it was because I was in a fight or it was a situation where uh, deadly force was imminent. It's not simply because I wanted to establish dominance. And in fact, when I went through uh, Policeman School 101, it was very big about downplaying your authority. Uh, time is on your side, generally. You always have the prerogative to arrest if there's a violation. There's no need to behave in that way unless there is a pressing need to behave in that way. Uh, the Canadian uh, the RCMP has... Um, uh, a saying, or is actually on a placard up there, it says, this is about deadly force. The use of deadly force is authorized only when a person is doing something so egregious that in, in order to stop him, it no longer matters whether or not he lives or dies. Similar with behaving in this way. Uh, behaving this way is authorized only when the person is engaging in, in behavior so egregious that it no longer matters whether you hurt their feelings or whether or not uh, you're behaving in an unprofessional way. The fact that you're involved in a physical altercation is proof positive that civility has failed. And in those cases, no one, I mean, people might say, oh, I don't like profanity, but no one's going to be like, oh, well, when you're fighting someone to the death, you should definitely still try to be as cordial as possible. No! When? But that wasn't the situation. This was a bunch of 14, 15-year-olds, scared shitless, who were just being uh, very, very poorly treated by uh, supposed public servants. You know, who had already betrayed them. Anyway. To use physical force only when the exercise of persuasion, advice, and warning is found to be insufficient to obtain public cooperation to an extent necessary to secure observance of law or to restore order, and to use only the minimum degree of physical force which is necessary on any particular occasion for achieving a police objective. Now, in the use of force spectrum, it, it, it runs the gamut of everything from verbal persuasion all the way up to the use of deadly force, and everything in between. It's difficult to call it a hierarchy because it's not linear. It's not like, well, no matter what's going on, you, you try verbal persuasion first. If that doesn't work, then it's unarmed defense. If that doesn't work, then it's your pepper spray and then your baton and then, you know, your taser and then the presentation of deadly force and the use of deadly force. No, if a person pulls out a gun, uh, you skip straight to presentation and use of deadly force. You don't try all the intermediate steps uh, in the mine run of cases. If a person isn't pulling out a firearm or some kind of deadly weapon, or an, and it doesn't seem like they're about to, then your weapon should remain holstered. Uh, when I was on the job, we, we had this drunk guy who was being you know, drunk. And so we're out dealing with him, and he, he made a move, and you could hear the clack of asps being brought out. There were seven of us. Seven of us. And virtually everyone pulled out their asp. I'm like, really? What is this all about? Seven of us can't take down one guy without asps? Come on, get real. Complete lack of uh, confidence in their, their unarmed fighting skills. Another problem. 
Uh, one of the problems that leads to this, by the way, and I know that the left isn't going to like this, but I'm going to say it anyway, is this, uh, this quest to include women has carry-on effects uh, when you want them to get into male-dominated fields that are properly male-dominated. The issue isn't if there are some women who can do well. There, there, indeed, there are. The problem is, is that once you let those women in, other women who can't do well see them and then complain their way to having, low, to having the standards lowered so that way inferior women can get in. Uh, and what that happens is, is when you lower the standards, it lowers it, it, lowers it for men too, and you will, perpet you will uh, see over the full, in the fullness of time that you'll get a weaker and weaker and weaker caliber of men. They'll become more posturing, more aggressive in their posture, uh, and less able to actually do the job, which is what you saw in the Democratic st stronghold of Coward County Sheriff's Office. Okay. Um, to maintain at all times a, a relationship with the public that gives reality to the historic tradition that the police are the public and the public are the police, the police being only members of the public who are paid to give full-time attention uh, to duties which are incumbent on every citizen in the interests of community welfare and existence. This is another place where I'll depart sharply with people uh, on the left, very far on the left, is that they think that it is the job of the police only to, uh, to respond and to do these types of things. Not so. As the appealing principles, uh, appealing principles point out, your law enforcement is drawn from the citizens and they have the same obligations as the citizens to see to the, to the security and welfare of the citizens' property, which citizens themselves also have. That's why in all 50 states you have citizens' detention and citizens' arrest. It's, it's the prerogative of the sovereign to insist, upon, uh, to insist that the laws be observed. You need not wait for police officers uh, to show up and not do anything. You can actually act on your own. Um, I'll address some solutions, some issues related to that in a separate video on, on gun rights. Uh, to recognize always the need for strict adherence to police executive functions and to refrain from even seeming to usurp the powers of the judiciary, of avenging, uh, avenging individuals uh, or the state, and of authoritatively judging guilt and punishment of the guilty. That's the job of the courts. Uh, and the police should be obedient to the legal requirements. I mentioned the Constitution. <clears throat> anyway, and then, and this is the last one. Uh, and this is, and this is, uh, actually, well, it's hard to say it's the most important. They're all important, but this is the most obvious of um, the effectiveness of law enforcement. To recognize always that the test of police efficiency is the absence of crime and disorder and not the visible evidence of police action in dealing with them. So the uh, PR spinning that happens in the media about law enforcement from law enforcement agencies themselves is an abdication of the last of the Peelian principles that the only criteria, the, the criterion that matters in assessing whether or not the police are doing uh, their core function is the absence and presence of crime. If you have a large presence of crime, the police failed. It's that simple. In this case, the police failed. It's that simple. Everything else is rhetoric. Everything else is BS. It's marketing. And I'll give you some examples. If you trace back to, because people like to mention this all got started at Columbine for some reason, so we'll start there. There's a documentary, uh, if I can find it, I'll put a link to it down below, um, about the Columbine shooting and how the police would talk about their officers' response and that the officers did what they did, you did what they could to save the lives of the children. And one of the, uh, one of the parents, uh, a mother and a father team, uh, mentioned that that's actually a lie. The police did nothing, absolutely nothing, to save a single life inside that building. Every life that was saved inside that school was saved by uh, the, the students themselves or one of the teachers. It was not a... The, the event would have been the same had no police officers arrived because they were completely, absolutely, 100% useless. And this was the model... Uh, for most police agencies in the United States at the time. If and when uh, you go to one of these situations, the job of the police was not to intervene, not to try to save life inside the event. It was to set up a perimeter, establish a cordon, and make sure that all the murdering that was going to take place would be contained inside the building, and to just let it play out uh, for the couple of hours, upwards of a couple of hours it might take for the SWAT team to show up. The line officer had no responsibility, and indeed should not, according to the doctrine of the day, lift a single fucking finger to save a single fucking life. Stand there and listen to these people be murdered. Just make sure that the murdering stays contained. This thinking in law enforcement has not gone away. 
Uh, some agencies have moved away from that, which is good. When there's an active shooter, uh, you get in there immediately. Active shooters, active shooting situations are different than hostage situations because the motivation of the offender is different. Uh, we still have the set up a perimeter and try to wait it out for hostage situations because many hostage situations can be resolved peacefully. Uh, where if you try to take an overly strong hand and raid the building, you wind up uh, risking lives in, in a way that you may not, depending on the, the stability of the hostage taker, otherwise be able to do if you're just more patient. Uh, but I will give some, I don't generally talk a great deal about my own personal life, but when I was uh, on the job, we had a hostage situation. And at the time, because everyone, I worked in a specialty section, which was a, the elite sections, um, where it was very competitive to get in. It wasn't an automatic right. You didn't get promoted to it because you did good in your job. You had to compete to get into any of the specialty sections, whether it be detective, whether it be traffic, whether it be can whatever it was. It was highly competitive. And... Uh, we had, this is where all of our SWAT members were uh, drawn from, from these specialty sections. In order to be on our SWAT team, you couldn't be a line officer. You had to be in one of these sections, and we always made sure that there was, uh, on shift at any time, an adequate number of people to put together a SWAT team to respond to anything uh, within minutes as opposed to having people on call or whatever. Uh, so in every different region, there, were always, there was always one SWAT team on duty doing their normal duties, but they had all their gear with them. And everyone in my section, except for the, uh, this gal named Nicole and I, who were the new people, uh, were gone for training. And so we were working 24-hour shifts. You know, no sleep for 24 hours. We were on patrolling, off, 24 on, 24 off. And finally the head shed figured out that this was happening because they saw us show up in briefs at times when it's like, didn't I see you, you know, last night? Yes. Didn't I see you yesterday afternoon? No. Yep, that was me. What's your shift work like? 24 on, 24 off. They're like, oh, this is bad juju. Uh, you will you will only work half the day. You remain on call the other half of the day. And we're like, oh, okay, whatever. So I was on call uh, on pager, and I'm at a Denny's when the when this was uh when it got toned out. And since I didn't have my radio on, I didn't hear it. And my pager goes off, and there were a couple of uh, police officers from a different agency who were sitting at a different table, and I'm just in you know ordinary clothes. I had my what it's an undercover raid jacket, you know, so the the police everything tucks up into pockets, and then when you get a call, you can untuck everything and it says police everywhere. It's re they're really cool. And uh, so, you know, I say pager. I get I get paged. I look at it. I see that it's the desk. I call, find out what's going on. I'm like, oh, shit. And I'm like, hey, guys, you hear what's going on? Because we're only like four or five miles away. Quick as four or five miles I, I've driven, I have to say. We were right by an interstate. Anyway, so, uh, you know, we're slipping inside and getting in there, setting up a perimeter for this hostage situation. And the way our mutual aid agreement worked is that... Um, uh, there was state state troopers were a backup agency for us, and so we had our SWAT guys and their SWAT guys and uh, the incident commander. Our uh, each had their own team. I'm sorry, their own plan for taking this out. Everything was briefed to the incident commander in case it needed to be done. Uh, both plans were pretty good. They were just you know, different strategies, and so we put both teams on standby for an order, and we were on different frequencies. So, for some reason or other, the incident commander gave both of us, both teams, the go order. And our point man, uh, so you have two SWAT teams who think the building is clear, except for where the hostage taker and the hostages are, are sent in different places, and eventually the, uh, the tragedy happens. The two teams meet, our point man put a round through the state trooper. To his credit, um, this is how good our marksmanship uh, was. As soon as he saw the rifle, the, the barrel coming around the corner, he was tracing it. And as soon as the hand poked around the corner, he put a bullet through the trooper's hand. It ricocheted off of his firearm and then came back out through his uh, near his elbow. So um, that gunshot let the hostage taker know that something was going on. He murders all the hostages. It was absolutely terrible. And then he kills himself. Two days later, our uh, our beloved chief, who had to resign, uh, who retired shortly after this, gave a big talk about how well things had turned out. I'm like, I don't know of a worst possible outcome that could have happened other than all the you know both SWAT teams getting blown up or something. You know, our guy shoots a state trooper because the incident commander is apparently so fucking incompetent that he sends in two SWAT teams telling neither that the other is in. All the hostages die. 
the bad guy kills himself. What more could have gone wrong? Like lightning strikes the building and sets it on fire? An industrial explosion sends chemical vapor over that kills everybody? I mean, there's nothing... This is the worst possible outcome, and here's the PR. Now, the individual, the, the SWAT guys, did an excellent job uh, on both teams. They did their job. It is an unavoidable or a very foreseeable consequence that if you send in two teams uh, who are there to kill somebody and you don't tell one team that you've sent in the other team uh, so that way you will inadvertently accidentally meet in your quest to get to the uh, the hostage taker, the, the would-be murderer, it is it is it follows almost as the night does the day that one of them is going to shoot the other because they don't know the other is there. They expect it to be empty. Uh, the only person who's walking around with a gun, obviously, is the hostage taker. And they have, anyway, absolutely terrible. But she says, great job. No, not a great job, ma'am. You're inept. The uh, sheriff in Florida also talking about how he's done all that he could. He's done great leadership. No, absolutely incompetent. Uh, you know, just terrible. So, this kind of uh, PR is it's all spin, it's all hype, it's all rhetoric. You should ignore it. The test for the if, uh, efficiency of law enforcement is outcomes in, in, a, in compliance with the law, of course. I, you know, there are many things you could, you could get better outcomes if you just violated the Constitution. Like if we just started randomly searching people's homes without any regard for the Fourth Amendment or beating confessions out of them, we could get results, but you know, we have laws that restrain that. So in accordance with the law, uh, so long as the laws are being obeyed by the police officers, all that matters is, uh, is, at the end of the day, is the outcome. So professional ethics, the law, outcomes, those are what matter. And with respect to whether or not the police are performing their function adequately, it's the presence or absence of crime, the existence or non-existence of an event. If the event is happening, law enforcement somewhere is failing. And it's, it, it is, of course, true that the responsibility for the murder is on the murderer. Of course, he's the one who's chosen to do it. But it's also true that the failure of law enforcement to deter, to investigate, uh, and in this case, to go into the building, uh, is also a non-trivial factor, without which the murder would either have not happened, or uh, once the event happened, it would have been severely mitigated. So these two, these two types of things, the intent, of the, uh, the intent and ability of the criminal, coupled with the lack of seriousness of the police department, its incompetence, its cowardice, whatever it is, that gave rise to officers sitting around on their thumb while listening to people being murdered, whether it be a policy, individual pusillanimity, whatever it is, those two factors conspired to lead to the deaths of these children, and also the existence of guns. I mean, anybody who says guns don't kill people, people kill people, the guns help. I mean, you know, if they didn't help, police officers wouldn't carry them. Police officers would go, oh my god, these guns are completely useless at killing people, let's get rid of them. No, of course they're useful. Uh, the issue on that front isn't whether or not they're useful, it's whether or not uh, the state should have the power to deprive people of their use, which is a separate issue. I know that the, the conservatives who aren't going to like my language in this video are going to like my want to hold law enforcement's feet to the fire, uh, to aggressively uh, police the conduct of law enforcement when they behave poorly or fail to behave properly, uh, to go after criminals and those types of things. Um, they're going to like that. And the left, who likes the, the civility that I'm talking about as a professional obligation, are going to like that. But uh, you know, half of you aren't going to half that half's not going to like my position on on the actual gun issue. So I don't expect you guys to stick around uh, for the next video, even though I'm pretty sure conservatives, pro Second Amendment people are going to love the next video, which I'll be making shortly. Other than that, those are my thoughts on the uh, the absolute uselessness of the Coward County Sheriff's Office. Have a great day.